BioBalance HealthCast, episode 179, Mammograms, Do We Really Need Them? BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. Today, Kathy and I are going to be talking about an article that appeared recently in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. We both live and work in St. Louis, and it was written by two physicians that are cancer uh, specialists and mammography specialists, and was responding to a recent uh, mammography study that was uh, done in Canada and to the conclusions of that study. And these two doctors here locally are challenging that study and saying, whoa, slow down, wait a minute. Because there's been a movement over the last three or four years to reduce the frequency by which women get mammographies because they're expensive. And the argument is they don't really need to have them so often because there's really not that much risk of breast cancer. And if you get breast cancer anyway, it's very treatable. Most people survive it. And so we don't have to be as afraid of it as we once were. They say early detection doesn't matter, which I challenge totally. Right. I, that, you, you that's go, not my experience. You go ballistic every time somebody says Yeah, it. because they their reasoning is, well, if we catch it later, then you can just have chemotherapy right. and that'll fix it. Right. Well, chemotherapy is a risky proposition mm-hmm. because chemotherapy shuts down all of your the system that actually kills cancers in your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. All the white cells are shut down. Everything is shut down. You get all kinds of other illnesses secondary to taking chemo. I don't find that to be an answer. I think it's better to find a mass when you can just remove it Mm -hmm. or have a mastectomy like Angelina Jolie did prophylactically. But you could just have a mastectomy and no more breast tissue, put implants in, and then you're done without having to go through chemotherapy. I don't think that that is a good reason to stop mammographies or to spread them out. My, my experience is that if women, all the breast cancers that I found in my practice with OBGYN mm-hmm. were generally women between 40 and 55. And, and the studies have said, oh, we don't need them between 40 and 50. That's right. ridiculous. Need them after 50. So it's and, very and not important, every year. and not every year. So, right. and the other cancer, the cancers that I found in patients were generally when they had waited an extra six months to a year, like they forgot last year's mammogram. Right. So when we found them, they were, they were more bad. Advanced. It's not that we wouldn't we would have found an earlier cancer. They may have just had a lumpectomy or something small mm-hmm. uh, if we found them last year. But finding them this year because we skipped a mammogram means they're going to have to go through chemo. Mm-hmm. Well, I think chemo is pretty expensive. I mean, I don't know what the cost-benefit ratio yeah, is, but it's it's a miserable experience. Right. And it takes away all your nutrients. It takes away a lot of things that you don't ever get back. Plus, you have to be bald for six months in general which, for that chemo, which, women, which is a big deal yeah, for women. Right. So th- this study just didn't match my experience. Well, these two doctors, uh, Dr. Barbara Monsies and Dr. Catherine Appleton, argue uh, t- two things. One, that the conclusions are wrong. Mm-hmm. And the other is that the conclusions are wrong because the study was poorly designed. Mm-hmm. Uh, what they say is that the mammography equipment that was used in the study wasn't the newest best stuff. Mm-hmm. and that the, Well, it's Canada, socialized medicine, so of course it's not the newest best stuff. They didn't say that. <laughs> That's your, what they That's said was not the newest best equipment. They also said that the, uh, the, the person... Uh, taking the mammogram had not been properly trained for breast mm-hmm. positioning on the, on the plate. Oh, well, that's very and, important. And then the, uh, there was one other thing I've lost track now, uh, that, that they had, Oh, that the random, uh, test group wasn't right. truly random because the women had all had breast exams previous to being included in it. So it wasn't just a walk-in population of mm-hmm. women in their forties. Right, and we don't know how they sorted out those women. Right, that they maybe they just everybody they couldn't feel a mass on they put in the study. We don't. Sometimes studies are done for a purpose, and some you know like we don't want women to have mammograms. How do we make this happen in the study? How do we make the answer? So you think there's a nefarious operation going on here? Yeah. So I mean, once somebody it, it's has an interesting. Agenda. It's just interesting that when our governments decided to take over healthcare, all of a sudden. 
there is a push to accept like herbal supplements and things like that that have been right. not what what we consider medicine in the not past because right. that's that's something what people pay for themselves and to decrease the amount of screening that's twofold. Screening costs a lot of money, like with PSA and pap smears. They, they've now made every three years, which, and and the parameters for pap smears. And that's I'm, an economic decision, it's not a an medical economic, decision. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, you have to understand where one time I was involved in how they made a decision at the federal level. Mm -hmm. The American College of OBGYN in 1980. Five, I was at their conference, and we actually went through the process of deciding at what age we should ultrasound women for genetic defects in their babies, okay? We looked at the studies. Is that first pregnancies or any pregnancy? Any pregnancy. Okay. So, we, so the way the government looked at it is never the way one person, one doctor, and one patient look at it. Right. This stu the studies they had, and there were huge studies, showed that Genetic abnormalities like Down syndrome or trisomy or really terrible genetic abnormalities begin at age 30, okay? But we ended up with this, the recommendation and the guideline that says every woman over 36 who's pregnant should get ultrasounds. And the way they did that, <laughs> you won't believe this, is they decided we're going to count the ultrasound sh machines in the United States, then we're going to look at the population, and we're going to decide what, at ratio. what age could we accommodate everyone at 36 right. and above who gets pregnant. Right. They did because not. Because at 36, you got fewer pregnancies. More women are getting pregnant at 30, 31, 32. It's just that we didn't have enough machines that year. Right. But, but, the but they number, were looking for the intersect. They were looking for where, when at this age, where we, yeah, the intersect, where we can actually accommodate everyone. Right. In 1985. Right. And I was pregnant at the time, and I was 30. <laughs> so this was, you know, this was important to me. Right. But they did it because of society's number of ultrasounds. Well, of course, once we decided this, everybody got an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. So we had lots more ultrasounds. They never adjusted the age. Mm -hmm. The age is the same. But in reality, we need ultrasounds after 30. Yeah. So, so if as that's a physician they, you know that. I know that. If I know that they're say, doing that with this. I want this woman to have an ultrasound. Then her insurance comes back and says they won't that's pay for not it. the standard of care. We they won't, won't pay, pay for, for it. it. That's right. That's they're doing the same thing with this. It's disheartening. I know it's disheartening. It but that's really what is. happens when you get the doctor patient relationship out of medicine. Yeah. And when I mean not that every doctor and every patient is ideal, but it sure is a lot better than deciding how much money we have and and decide and or then right. not by scientific information but just by what we have and then never changing that right we i mean we had ultrasounds ever since 85 we had an ultrasound in our office i have an ultrasound in my office to look for like pellets and somebody's got a goiter i i, I don't charge for them i just Look for them just for well, you know machinery's gotten reassurance. better and more portable and more right. affordable and so on. But that's not how you should decide about right. what a patient needs. Mm -hmm. You should look at some. Uh, you should look at the patient and say, if the risk goes up at thirty, we should do an ultrasound at thirty. So just think how many defects we've missed in babies because the government decided to be big brother and decide for us, not based on medical in information. So that's what I worry about every time I read a study like this that does not follow my medical research that I've read and my medical experience. Well, this article in the Post-Dispatch also quotes another study that makes your point pretty dramatically. It's a Harvard study, not a Canadian study. <laughs> and it says that 70% of the women who died from breast cancer were in the uh, breast cancer in their 40s were in the group uh, which was 20% of the women not getting regular mammograms. Right. So if you've got 20% of the women who are not getting regular mammograms for whatever reason mm -hmm. in their 40s and, and they develop breast cancer, 70% of those women died. Right. 
or no, 70% Early, of said, all the women who all died, the women who were, died were, in were that subset. Right. And the, the deal is is that if you're 40 and above, you need a mammogram every year. Right. That's just, so don't wait till 50 and so don't, don't do wait till 50 year. and don't listen to these guys. This is just not good for the individual. It's only good for whoever's paying for the testing. But at some point, the then it, it comes down to a personal challenge. Because if the insurance company isn't going to pay for it, then as the patient, you have to say, is this important enough to me that I will spend my money on it? Because right. But if you go into a radiology life. department right. and you say, my insurance won't pay for this, would you give me a discount? They will. Because so the insurance you company, because there's a difference between their fee, they have to put in a fee that is actually a fee that represents what they should be charging. Right. But the insurance company then pays them like a tenth of the fee. Right. They'd like to get 50% of the fee. Right. They'll still be able to do business at 50%. So Which they will do a, discounts. Uh, that's not a message that people typically get from their doctors. Go in anyway and negotiate for a discount. What the doc, and, they did or at with, least I don't hear that. They, they the did it with, with testing. That's how it works. Yeah. I mean, but I don't, like, I don't take insurance, so what I charge is what, I, what it costs. So right. I can't do that. But in insurance-based medicine, the charge is fairly high and the reimbursement's fairly low. So there's right. some place in between where they'll still make a profit and you'll be saved the money, but you need the test. Right. Uh, an example was I have, a, I have a patient who came to me and said, I have a bad feeling and I missed my mammogram last year. Right. Okay. I have a bad feeling. Bad feeling does not get you a mammogram. <laughs> and so I said, okay, so I'm going to write them. I'm going to do a, a more, more views, three views, not a screening mammogram, but a diagnostic mammogram. So it's a different I, way to phrase it. Right. So the insurance company will look at it as a different trigger. Right. Different category. That's right. But right. it turned out that her insurance company would pay for the mammogram. She right. was over 45 was and we were paying for mammograms then. Right. And she was overdue. It was two years. Right. So, but she said, you know, mm, I know that 20%, she's a nurse, I know that 20% of the people that get mammograms, we can't see the cancer. Right. But we can see them on ultrasound. Okay. She said, so I'd really like an ultrasound too. I said, I'll write it. Hopefully it'll get paid for. Mm -hmm. So she went in to a freestanding um, mammogram center. She gave them the requisition for me. So she gets the mammogram and they say, it's fine. Mm -hmm. She said, I still have a bad feeling. I want my ultrasound. No, you, they won't pay for it. The radiologist came out and tried to talk her into not doing it. She said, I have an order from my doctor. Mm -hmm. I want the ultrasound. And they refused. She said, I'll pay for it. And, and in the end, she was persistent enough, thank God, that she said, I'm getting the ultrasound somewhere. If you won't do it, I'll go somewhere else. But right. if I have cancer, it's going to be a problem for you. They said, okay. Yeah. So they ultrasounded her, and she had a one centimeter, like that big mass in her breast. And they biopsied it right there, and they were chagrined. They were mortified. I mean, she just had a feeling, and women have feelings like that. Men out there, I can't explain it, but they're usually right. Yeah. That when they had that strong a feeling, she had cancer. It was treatable by a mastectomy. No chemo, no radiation, nothing, no nodes. It hadn't spread. She's cured. If she would waited a year right. and come back, they probably would have seen it with mammogram only. But she would have had to have chemo, and she might have had a risk of dying later in life. Well, that is early, early diagnosis. You make a statement offhandedly about chemo and breast cancer. Chemo would, and, any, but, and any cancer. And any cancer. Uh, I, would you care to go into that at yes. this point? Because w what the argument is often being made now about breast cancer, well, we can just do chemo. Yeah, like it's nothing. Yeah. Well, people who, who get chemo are at higher risk for other cancers the rest of their lives. Okay. So because it suppresses your immune system? It suppresses your immune system, and that, that may kill that one cancer. Right. But then another cancer will pop up. Or it also affects your bone marrow. And the cells in your bone marrow. So oftentimes the cancer that is found later is lymphoma or leukemia. Because under the chemo, you suppressed. You, you, damaged the, you damaged the stem cells in the bone marrow. Right. And oftentimes people who have chemo have 
basically it uses up all of their nutrition. And yeah. it would help if people who got chemo actually had a doctor that took care of their nutrition at the same time. And there are some clinics that are not paid for by insurance that actually do that and help people through chemo so that they can actually stay, have a good nutritional base while this, it's a poison. If you need it for cancer, you, you get it. But if you, if we could avoid it, it would be better. So these are the reasons to avoid it. Nutritional, um, all, all of your minerals, all of your vitamins, all of your proteins are broken down and your hair follicles are killed. Okay. Yeah. That's this idea. Just imagine that all the other cells in your body are kind of going through that same thing. It reminds me of the analogy that we used to use back in the 1960s before the nuclear test ban treaty that, <laughs> that the best way to clean a cockroach infestation out of your house is not with a nuclear bomb. <laughs> It'll do it, yeah. But it's not right. the best way to do it because right. everything is gone. The the flip side of that is, if you're if you have a life threatening cancer, right? If you it's need an chemo, you got to survive now. And then it's worthwhile right. to then risk getting something else down the line. But your argument is that the mammography, the regular mammography, will help identify those earlier so that they don't reach the life threatening point, so that chemo is the appropriate response. That's right. And if you get a mammography and an ultrasound, that covers both. Right. So I think we need more testing, not less. Preventive and medicine. Preventive medicine. Why should we find it? This this woman's life, she's done. She's yeah. done with cancer. Right. That, I mean, her breast cancer is done. She's right. not going to get anything. She's not going to get cancer somewhere else because of this. Right. And she has no breast tissue left because she had it removed. Yeah. Ideal. She can Which even take. Which is what Angelina She can Jolie even did. take hormones. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. So, so. In my view, and of all the people I've seen, you know, I've seen, I've watched people over 29 years in my practice, and I had a lot of people who stayed with me the whole time. So I've watched people who smoke, drank, obese, obesity, all of these things that increase your risk of breast cancer, plus right. genetics, but only half the people that get breast cancer have positive family history. Right. So... Often we have we have things that occur in the environment, or we choose to do things that increase our risk of breast cancer. But having said that, you can't go backwards. Right. So the only way to prevent dying from breast cancer or dying from any cancer is surveillance and actually looking for the cancer early on and during the high risk time, which is from 40 on. Right. And we've talked about that before. So appropriate intervention, monitoring, testing at the right time. At the right time. And we've talked about why that is, because your immune system, which keeps us from getting cancer of any kind, starts dropping in activity and the number of the T killer cells at 40 because our testosterone drops. So if you want to go one step farther backwards to prevent it, mm -hmm. then you get your testosterone replaced so that you keep your immune system going so that you can kill cancer cells. Which so, you can read about in our book, the secret com. <laughs> yeah, but that's not why I said that. <laughs> that's because that's just one step back in in, yeah. in um, preventive up, medicine. Up the food chain for prevention. Right. Yeah. So you you kind of have to look at the source. Why did this all start happening? And at early 40? interventions are actually cheaper. Of course they are. I mean, they they truly are long term. And so Medicare pays very little for a mammogram. Right. It's like ten bucks. That's what they pay these radiology departments. So. In the end, it's not that much money. It's just that they don't want to spend the money on us. <laughs> so, so the point being, if you hear about this Canadian study, be aware that, that reputable American doctors believe that it is flawed for multiple reasons. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, be aware that there is an agenda in this country to reduce the number and frequency of mammograms. And that may not be in your own personal best interest. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.